Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q. In this video, I'll be looking at the Tier 7 Italian Light Fighter Premium aircraft, the Reggiani RE2005. Hello there, and here on the tarmac outside my hangar is the Reggiani RE2005, one of the last Italian fighter designs entering operational service in the early part of 1943. Despite that relatively early date, only about 48 examples were delivered to the uh, Regia Aeronautica before the Italian armistice of September 1943. The surviving planes were used to defend Italian cities against Allied attacks, and eventually, with German insignia, they appeared over Berlin in the final stages of World War II. It was liked by Italian pilots, and it was rated highly in both German and British assessments. In the game, it features below average armament, not very good manoeuvrability, which belies the assessment of both the Germans and the British, and an airframe that puts it alongside the BF 109K6, but without that plane's enormous hitting power, and the P-51D Mustang, but it's even less agile than that plane. This means it requires a relatively high skill level in order to perform well, a departure from the recent trend of premium planes being powerful. This is more like an old-fashioned premium plane, one that is only as good, maybe a little inferior to, tech tree planes. So what we'll do now, we'll take a look at the numbers of the aircraft and begin to get an idea of what it's all about. Here we have the spreadsheet for all of the Tier 7 fighters. There are 17 of them. Let me just scroll sideways and you can see them coming along. Now, this spreadsheet, if you don't know how it works, use the link below to an introduction video and that will tell you what's going on here. And with that, let's get into the armament. The rating is 19, the cumulative DPS 330. This is what I would call below average. It's not mediocre, but it's certainly not amongst the better armaments on Tier 7 fighters. For instance, right next to it, we have the Meteor, which is the second, third best in class, the BF 109K6 with its enormous hitting power, better than any Tier 8 fighter, let alone a Tier 7 fighter. Right over here, we have the Key 84 Hayati, and if you just look at these figures as I scroll back, you can see the A7M Repu has got a rating of 25, and there are other aircraft with higher ratings as well most of them in fact. So below average armament in terms of both rating and DPS. Not actually worst in class, you can see there's no red here, but not particularly uh, impressive either. We have a single 20 millimeter cannon firing through the hub. The DPS is 90 on that gun, rate of fire of 420. Range is okay at 2362, not brilliant, certainly not bad. Auto angle, the amount you can be off target by and the game correct your aim for you is three degrees, which is relatively generous. Dispersion angle, that's the way the shells spread out as they leave the muzzle of your gun, is a relatively good 0 0.55. 0 0.6 is much more common. Overheat time, pretty good at eight seconds. And the shell velocity, not bad at 1240, but again, it does mean that you are going to have to learn how to lead with this aircraft. It's slow enough for the lead to be quite large. There are two more of these cannons mounted on the wings. Similar statistics, but not the same. 90 DPS, that's the same. 420 rate of fire, that's the same. 2,362 feet range, again the same. Here's where we get our first difference. The auto angle is worse. It's only 2 degrees. These are less accurate guns. And the dispersion is a bit worse as well. It's 0.65. The bullets spread out more as they leave the muzzle of the gun. Now, interestingly, if you were to quickly look at the cannons, which are 30 millimeters on the K6, you'll see that these statistics, auto aim angle, dispersion angle, are exactly the same, both for the hub-mounted cannon and for the wing. High degree of similarity there. I think uh, the World of Warplanes team may have been taking a couple of shortcuts in developing this aircraft. Overheat time remains the same at 8 seconds and the shell velocity is 1240 as well. So once you've got the lead for one of the cannons, you'll be hitting with all three. That's the good news. Not quite so good news on the machine guns. The DPS is fairly low at 30 each. Rate of fire 700. Range is on the short side. Normally I'd expect at least 1600, maybe even more. Um, but we've actually got below 1600 feet here, 1575. Auto aim angle could be more generous as well. Again, it's only three degrees. Four degrees is more common on machine guns. 
However, the dispersion at 0.7 is pretty good. Quite frequently, you'll get 0.8. Overheat, as you would expect for machine guns, fairly long, 20 seconds. But here's a nasty uh, sting in the tail. Only 948 feet shell velocity. And this means that given that you've got to give a lot of lead, if you're firing at anything banking away from you at relatively large distance, you're going to meet the miss with the machine guns or the cannons. And frankly, I suggest you try and miss with the machine guns and not the cannons. Survivability. Again, all these figures are compressed for light fighters. The long and short of it is it's somewhere in the middle. It looks as if it's pretty good because there's a lot of uh, blue, green and uh, purple here, meaning second best, third best and first uh, in class. However, there's also some red down here, as you can see, simply because all of those figures are compressed. So we've got a rating of seven below the rating on the rate um, spread on the uh, website um, where it's overstated. I don't know why. No surprise to me, though. I saw that coming. 300 hit points is okay for a light fighter. Damage resistance, again, okay at 46. And the fire resistance is 60, which is the best in class. And that's good news. It means you're going to be able to mount a first aid dressing kit without having to worry about compensating for it with, um, for instance, pilot skills, fire resistance, firefighter. Airspeed, 57. It's a little bit tricky to place this. It's on a par with the Meteor and the Kostikov and the BF109K6 at first blush. Um, and as you go across, you can see lots of the high energy fighters have similar ratings. And then once you start getting into the term fighters, by and large, those speeds drop off. That's what you'd expect. However, the devil is in the detail here. The good news is, and surprisingly, the cruise speed is best in class and by some quite some distance as well. 320 run one is really um, good. Now, this piece of information was missing when the first air aircraft first appeared uh, in, for instance, the application programming interface, the API for the game. Uh, and I was honestly expecting this to be around about 250, 260, fairly low, because unfortunately the boost maximum speed is not good. It's only 416. If we drop down to worst in class figures, we can see that's second worst in class. Um, which makes this a bit of a contradictory aircraft. The airframe appears to be quite slippy and quick, but the engine doesn't seem to be able to get the aircraft up to any great speed under boost, and that's a problem. Boost is nice at 10 seconds. The only aircraft that are better than this are the two Mustangs, the P-51K and the P-51D. However, the dive speed is not that good at 522. It's better than the turn fighters, but then you wouldn't be using diving as a tactic. But it's worse than all of the energy fighters apart from the I-220. And immediately you can begin to see that um, the P-51K Mustangs, in terms of the airframe, and certainly in terms of airspeed, are probably certainly competitive with this plane. In fact, they go about it quite differently. The Mustangs are actually slow in terms of cruise speed, but they boost much better. What I'm trying to say is watch out for the P-51s. They're going to be potent enemies, especially if you find Elise Clark in the P-51D. And then, as we're about to see, the maneuverability of that plane is going to be considerably greater than yours, more than likely. Of course, that's going to depend on how you build the aircraft. As for the K6, I'll just state the completely obvious. Don't go head on with it because you're going to be obliterated. And that gives you a problem because if you can't outmaneuver this plane and it, the maneuverability is very tight, um, there's not much margin between you and the K6 at base, especially if it critical, criticals you on the way through on a pass, you're probably going to have to disengage and run away from this plane rather than try and turn fight it. And that's a bit of a surprise to me. I thought we'd have more agility in hand and able to get behind a, a 109K6 and destroy it. Beginning to hear that this is quite a tricky aircraft to fly. And some of that's explained by a manoeuvrability rating, which is distinctly lacking. I have next to this plane the only three tier seven fighters which are less manoeuvrable. The Meteor F1, the Kostikov 302 and the BF 109K6, but it, there's not much in it. These two airframes tend look as if they have very similar figures for manoeuvrability, which is a bit of a surprise because the aircraft, certainly in the British assessment, was regarded as being very manoeuvrable and the World of Warplanes team don't seem to have honoured that in the game. So rating of 59, turn time of 11.4 seconds, roll rate is okay at 135, theoretically third best in class. 
Controllability, however, is a bit of a disappointment. At 81.9, it means the aircraft's going to slide through the air rather than respond quickly to your instructions to turn. Minimum optimum speed is 163, maximum optimum speed 489 miles an hour. Now, this is unusual, and I don't think it's going to be a significant factor, but it is worth just pointing out that your characteristics will not degrade over the widest range of speeds for any Tier 7 fighter. This is the best in class. However, I don't really see how you're going to be able to exploit that, except just be safe in the knowledge that you can pretty much fly this aircraft as you wish, and you're going to retain all of your characteristics at the maximum level. Stall speed of 96, probably not going to be able to use that as a tactic, especially if you're trying to keep the aircraft fast, but there is just the possibility of making something overshoot you. The altitude performance is a little bit of a disappointment. It's not really as good as um, most of the high energy fighters, the Meteor being the exception here, because that's a relatively low altitude aircraft. As you can see, the Kostikov, the BF-109K6, the um, Gustav, uh, the I-220 and the PK P-51 Mustangs all have superior altitude performance. Your at optimum is 6,562 feet and your ceiling is about 13,000 feet. Climb rate, I'm afraid it's not particularly good news. Against the high energy fighters, it's lacking. Now what we can tell about acceleration in the game comes from the power to weight ratios. These are not particularly great either. They're not worst in class, but there's no indication here that the aircraft is going to pick up speed very quickly when you press the throttle. Um, we don't know about drag in the game. Having flown the aircraft fairly extensively, I don't feel it accelerates particularly quickly. And on the other hand, I don't think it's a sluggard to respond to throttle instructions to speed up. It just uh, is average. Quickly look at the worst in class figures, see if there's anything else we can pick up. Well, there's that controllability being rated as third best in class, which means your changes of direction aren't going to be particularly rapid. And I don't think there's anything else there that detains us. So, at first blush, the figures here suggest to me a high energy fighter and one upon which you would employ a speed build. When you see the next section, you're going to uh, see a feature of the aircraft which is going to compromise that. And the other thing you've got to think about potentially is, do you want to set up this aircraft in order to combat BF-109K6s, which are probably built for speed, but not necessarily so. And unfortunately, mentioning the elephant in the room, you're going to be fighting a lot of Tier 8 aircraft with this um, Reggiani, and particularly you're going to be finding P-61s. And a speed build is not going to help you against a P61. It will hunt you down. And it's going to have, very likely, pretty good manoeuvrability. And if you opt for a speed build, probably as good as, if not better, manoeuvrability than you have. In which case, you might want to start thinking about employing a, a manoeuvrability equipment. I'm going to go through this later in the video in some detail. So, as a high energy fighter, <laughs> which you would normally put a speed build on, I foresee problems. This looks like a pretty average aircraft. It doesn't destroy aircraft on the first pass, which is a problem. That means you are going to have to pick your engagements very carefully. It also means that you are going to have to learn to disengage and not turn uh, with um, planes that you do not destroy, unless you are very confident that they're not going to be able to turn you, such as bombers, ground attackers, heavies, certain multi-rolls, certain fighters if you manage to perhaps take their wing or tail out as you go by or you're going to have to do something which i wouldn't normally do with an aircraft with this kind of profile and opt for some sort of maneuverability build because you're thinking about combating for instance k6s p61s and i can tell you from experience actually either will work but neither is going to make the aircraft a monster. So let's go and see how I've set this aircraft up. In the post build uh, effects section, I'll show you a full speed build, two full speed builds, in fact, and also a full maneuverability build. Here we are with the Red Gianni RE2005. My aircraft is specialised, which means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. When you first get this aircraft, it will look like this. You have four equipment slots, one of which is locked, that's on the airframe. Uh, the other equipment slots are cockpit, engine, 
and this is going to be a surprise to many forward firing weapons. More on that in a moment. On the consumables you've got five slots, two on the engine, but one of those is locked. Now, I don't believe that any of the other tier 7 fighters has this equipment slot, and this is good news from one point of view and bad news from another. In the first place, it's good news because if you mount gas operated action, you can improve what are pretty average guns by imp uh, increasing their rate of fire and therefore their damage output. And this is good news and welcome. However, it's coming at the expense of having a second slot on usually the engine, sometimes the airframe, and that is going to hamper you in terms of improving the airframe's maneuverability or speed. Let's see what I did. I've popped the aircraft into specialist configuration and you can see that I've filled the slots as follows. Gun sight in the cockpit slot, polished skin in the airframe slot, uprated engine in the engine slot and gas operated action in the forward firing weapon slot. I've flown this aircraft in a variety of ways. I've flown it with this build, which is a speed build using an uprated engine. I've used the other speed build which is um, the same build except that I've substitute, substituted um, the uh, combined injection boost system for the uprated engine and I've also used a full maneuverability build which is a lightweight power unit and a lightweight wing frame in place of the polished skin and the uprated engine and I'll show you those builds in the post build effect so you can get a feel for the kinds of numbers that you'll get this is just using standard equipment and none of this is calibrated as it happens so you'd be able to do better than um, I will show you in the post build effects bear that in mind there is of course also room for a mixed build you could have for instance lightweight wing frame with the uprated engine or you could have that with the combined injection boost system would I do it the other way around a lightweight power unit and polished skin Maybe, but probably not. I haven't tried that to be fair, but you'll get an idea from the figures that I do show you. On the gun side, it's not calibrated, so there'll be more to come. And this typically, bonus characteristics, uh, I would put on machine guns. They're probably not the bonus characteristics I would have um, setting up this aircraft. I haven't flown it lot, a lot of my regular accounts. So I haven't bothered with bonus characteristics on my regular account. I've done most of my flying testing the aircraft on the press account to which I have access. But here, I would probably pick off the 5% accuracy of targets, the 3% um, when firing at moving targets, the 3% accuracy, um, pure accuracy, bonus characteristics, second from bottom there, and probably also the 5% um, um, pilot's resistance to injuries to offset uh, um, the fact that the pilot gets injured more frequently um, with this piece of equipment. So I'd actually pick the other three bonus characteristics there rather than these three. Having said that, you might and want to keep at least one of the criticals maybe you'll want to try and do critical damage as you pass an aircraft um, so that it perhaps can't turn as quickly um, or it's just slowed down by the engine being damaged anything to make it something you can flee from which is something you're going to have to do quite a lot in this plane polished skin and um, again I would probably reconfigure this aircraft as well not particularly interested in the diving so the one percent cruise speed i would keep mm, probably not the your maneuverability so one percent maximum speed with boost activated at the bottom i would probably substitute in and maybe the two percent acceleration whilst diving if you're looking for a bit of maneuverability maybe you'd pick off the maneuverability characteristics there but that kind of flies in the face of a speed build on the operated engine again Calibration is only 400 here. 5% engine cooldown rate is selected. I would probably want the engine cooldown rate definitely. Half percent cruise speed. Well, there's a 1% one there, so you'd probably pick that one. And then another half percent speed with maximum boost. So I'd change one characteristic here, drop the half percent cruise speed, and go for the 1% cruise speed. This is purely looking at it from the angle of um, speed, of course. And on the gas operated action, again, there's more to come here, but it's not. Um, uh, being calibrated at all so the technological level is down at its minimum of 400 and here I would pick off 10% cooldown rate another 5% of accuracy probably and another 2.5% rate of fire that's the characteristic at the bottom uh, to try and improve this um, DPS on the consumables even though I've got an uprated engine um, uh, mounted I'm comfortable with the first aid dressing package Pneumatic control assist to give me more maneuverability. The alternatives here don't really interest me. However, there is an argument to have the emergency control system. 
um, if you're fighting something that damages your control surfaces or you're just trying to fly away quickly then you'll want to repair this so actually that is a fairly strong argument for the emergency control system if you get your wing damaged you're just a bit slower and thinking about flight fleeing from aircraft it would be a good idea to be able to repair this so actually maybe that would be the better choice engine cooling for 10 extra seconds of boost alternatives if you're really looking for um, the maximum amount of speed then you'd put on the improved mixture control um, especially as this aircraft doesn't boost particularly quickly that might not be a bad choice actually so there's an alternative for you engine restart you will probably want to restart your engine and then universal ammunition if you're going to load gold you're probably going to fire the fragmentation ammunition let's talk about pilot skills When it comes to pilots, an important question to answer for a premium aircraft is, is it usable as a crew trainer? And here's an important and interesting feature about this aircraft, a good feature. It is a crew trainer, not so much because you can train Italian pilots, because there are no other Italian aircraft in the game. But what you can do is click on the plane and change the nation. And for instance, if I want to change this to the United States, I click the United States here. And if I want to commit to this change, it's going to cost me 100,000 credits. I have to decide what to do with the pilot, which in this case I would probably do um, send back to the barracks and then progress. You can change it back to the Italian nation for free. But if you want to change it to another of the major five nations, such as the UK, that will cost you another 100,000 credits. Now, I'm not going to do that right now, but there is an interesting point here, particularly if you're going for a maneuverability build something you can consider is changing this aircraft either to the US or to the UK if you have the special pilots Elise Clark or Millie Elliott or indeed both you can pop them in the plane and get extra maneuverability and that might be something you want to do if you're going for a maneuverability build in this case I've kept the aircraft as Italian I need to show you something else that's important this aircraft is not in the tech tree and that means you will only be able to get this aircraft in the way that you get other premiums either the World of Warplanes team will decide to offer it at some point in crates or they will put it on sale but that will be a long time from the making of this video so be warned if you were thinking you'd be able to pick up this aircraft for gold from this tech tree it appears that's not going to be the case. I have an Italian pilot and I have a trained Italian pilot and it, he's trained for a speed build and this is a nine point pilot which is quite a lot of grinding if you've got free experience happy days you can get there quicker I went for aerodynamics expert, immediately went for engine guru one, then marksman one, and I have put engine guru two on there. You probably work through this, I guess, through battle tested or possibly through cruise flight, depends on your preference for either dealing with damage or getting more speed, cruise flight for speed, battle tested for dealing with damage better. And then I've been working my way up probably to marksman one, certainly cruise flight. If you were going for a maneuverability build, it's slightly different. Go for aerodynamics again. It's debatable as to whether you should pick off one of these two first, but either the second, third or fourth skill you will want aerobatics expert for the maneuverability build. And then again, probably concentrate on this group. And this time, possibly a very long way into the future, you'd be going up to evasive target. In terms of the speed build, again, a very long way in the future, you'd probably be heading towards resilience. So that's my Italian pilot. He can't fly anything else, of course. And many of you, I suspect, will use the option to change the nation of this aircraft and train other crew members or possibly to use those special pilots. Let's go and have a look at some post build effects for three different builds. Here we have a spreadsheet showing the effects that you might get indicative numbers for three different builds. Two speed builds, one maneuverability build. The base figures for the aircraft are in columns C and D. You've seen these before in the aircraft statistics section. The first speed build is in columns E and F, and the effects, the difference between those and the base figures are expressed in absolute terms in column G and in percentage terms in column H. And this um, speed build um, uses the following equipment. Gun sight, polished skin, uprated engine, and gas operated action. As far as the pilot's concerned, the skills that are uh, in effect here are Aerodynamics Expert, Engine Guru 1, Engine Guru 2 and Marksman 1. So what have we got? Got an improvement in the rating of the guns from 19 to 21, that's 10.5%. 
DPS has gone up to 372. You can do better than this. The technological equipment uh, level of all four pieces of equipment is 400. You can calibrate these up to 478. Of course, you've got other choices. If you happen to have experimental equipment lying around, for instance, you might use that instead and thus get an even better effect. So bear in mind, the figures are indicative. They're not the maximum you can obtain. So 372 there, 12.8%, nearly 13% improvement. This is welcome. And you can just see the effects. The rate of fire goes up by 12.8%, therefore the damage output goes up by 20%. So for example, on the machine guns, from 700 rate of fire to 790, DPS from 30 to 34. And similarly on the other two guns, if you just want to have a quick look there and there. We've also improved the accuracy. We've managed to get the auto angle and the hub mounted cannon out to 3.15 uh, degrees, which is better than three. And we've got the dispersion, the way the shells spread out as they leave the muzzle of your gun down to 0.47. Tighter cone means that more of them will hit it for longer distance, of course. Similar effects, but of course, worse accuracy to begin with on the wing mounted uh, cannons. So uh, respectively, the auto angle has gone up to 2.1 and the dispersion angle has gone down to 0.56. And on the um, machine guns, again, 3.15 is the all time angle and 0.6 is the dispersion angle. Because we haven't fitted long gun barrels, we've got no effect on the range. If you do fit long gun barrels, I reckon you'll be able to get the range up from 2,362 feet to somewhere between, depending on how much you improve the equipment, um, 2,600 feet, 2,700 feet, maybe a bit more. Um, if you're a good sharpshooter, you might want to do that instead of improving the DPS of the guns. It's not for me, but it's something that worth um, it's worth you considering. Because we've fitted an uh, uprated engine, we've got an adverse effect on the fire resistance. We've lost 14 points, down to 46. I choose to live with that. I can still I still feel happy mounting the first aid dressing kit and not expending pilot skill points, for instance, on fire resistance or firefighter. Airspeed is where you want to see the big increase, and there would be more to come, of course. It's already got up to 66, which is very nearly a 16% increase. Got the cruise speed up to 384, that's an improvement of 63 miles an hour, and I reckon if you really went for it, tried to maximise everything you could about this, so full calibration on the equipment, perhaps using experimental equipment, 420, maybe even a bit more might be possible, and that would be a very fast aircraft indeed, um, in terms of its base speed. Boost maximum speed, a little bit of an improvement. It's gone up by 14 miles an hour to 430. Still fairly slow under boost. Um, and I'll talk more about that uh, when I come to discuss the next um, speed build. We haven't lost any um, boost, which is good. So we've still got 10 seconds. Can't do anything about the dive speed. We just look at the airspeed. We've also got a couple of effects here, which aren't shown um, in the figures, only as by lines in the UI. 15.5% acceleration without boost and an improvement of 5% acceleration with boost. Maneuverability, it's gone down a little. Lost a couple of points. We've now got the same turn time as the K6. We've made the airframe air stiffer, so bear that in mind. K6s, if you want to focus on those, you probably need a different type of build. That will be the third build that we discuss. We've also lost 1.8% yaw manoeuvrability. And finally, on the UI figures, we have an improvement of 13 feet per second in terms of the climb rate, which is not going to help you. Other effects that are just shown as bylines, we've got a reduction in the ability of the pilot to um, resist in injury by 7%. This particular build was with an exhaust bleed inerting system. And we've already talked about the pilot skills there. So that's the first build. Gun sight, polished skin, uprated engine, gas operated action. Let's take a look at the second build. The second build is also a speed build. What we have done, the difference between this and the previous build is that we now have a combined injection boost system and we've dropped the uprated engine. All the equipment, Otherwise, it's the same gun sight, polished skin, gas operated action, and also the technological level of the equipment in every case is 400. That means you could calibrate this equipment and get better figures than you're, I'm about to discuss. You could, again, use experimental equipment to get even better effects. We don't need to discuss the guns. Um, and let me just quickly explain that the post-build effects for this build are in 
uh, columns i and j, the difference in column k, absolute terms, in percentage terms, it's in column l. We can ignore the guns because they're identical to the previous build. On the survivability, because we've dropped the uprated engine, we've now got 60 hit points again on the fire resistance. And then on the airspeed, we've got an increase in the rating to 63. This is not as high as the previous build. That's six points or 10 and a half percent. We have improved the um, cruise speed by 37 miles an hour, 11 and a half percent. And we've got the boost maximum speed up to 459, an improvement of 43. Still not great but certainly a lot better than 416. However, there's a penalty. We've lost one and a half seconds of boost to do that. On the maneuverability, identical setup to the previous build. So we've now got K6 levels of maneuverability again. And on the altitude performance, we've got an improvement in the climb rate up to 462 feet per second. That's 41 feet. I'm not sure you'll notice that, but apparently it's enough to give us a rating improvement of one point. Um, Things that aren't listed in the uh, UI, except as bylines, the guns, they will be the same. Survivability will be the same. Um, airspeed, we've got some different effects here. 15.5% acceleration with boost, 9.5% acceleration in a dive, 5% acceleration without boost, and a 5% engine cooldown rate improvement as well. Um, Maneuverability, again, same effect as previously. Same consumable, same pilot skills. And that brings me to the point of discussing whether speed builds are the way to go. Of the two, I much prefer the first build. I find it's better for me, at least, to have the aircraft generally fast, which means better cruise speed. I didn't find that the effect of improving the boost speed gave me anything that I particularly liked about the aircraft. Uh, and it just felt a little bit sluggish and I felt I wasn't able to chase down particularly heavies as well as I could with the previous speed build. The big drawback with both these builds is if you want to focus on what you're going to do about the K6 and, of course, the P61. These builds put you in the same kind of maneuverability, or perhaps worse, if a little bit of maneuverability has been built onto the K6 and the P61 is likely to be pretty maneuverable anyway. And this is going to make it hard to fight those. With the K6, you can't afford to go head on. It could critical you if you take evasive action and then you can't turn on it. All you can do is really dis disengage. And that puts you at a serious disadvantage against a reasonably well flown K6 against the P61. This turn build actually puts you in the region of the P61s being able to out turn you. And that's a problem. So what would be a solution to that? Well, let's have a look at build three. Build three consists of a gun sight a lightweight wing frame, lightweight power unit, and a gun gas operated action. Again, the technological level of these, these equipments is 400. You can calibrate these and therefore you'll get better figures than the ones you're about to see. You could, of course, use different bonus characteristics and indeed use experimental equipment and so on to get better figures. These are indicative. No change in the gun, so we'll skip over that again. But survivability, there are some adverse effects. We've still got a rating of seven, but we've lost at least seven, if not eight hit points here of um, um, off the airframe. We've also got uh, the damage resistance down to 44 from 46. No effect on the fire resistance though, which is a good thing. Airspeed. Because of the choice of bonus characteristics, we have still got a marginal effect, even though this is a maneuverability build. It comes on the cruise speed. It's up by 11 miles an hour to 332. That's enough to actually to give us an extra rating point. Um, but this is not the point of this build. What you're thinking about here is combating things like the K6 and the P61. Just a quick point here, you could blend the speed build and the maneuverability build. For instance, you could use the lightweight wing frame instead of a polished skin, but keep an uprated engine, or if you prefer the combined injection boost system, could do it the other way around as well. Keep one of those two latter pieces of equipment and use, uh, uh, rather drop the latter pieces of equipment and use a lightweight power unit uh, and then use polished skin. I haven't tried that. To me, that feels like the worst of all worlds. Some of you may actually think it's the best of all possible worlds. Just bear that in mind, you have that option as well. So we come to maneuverability, and as you would expect, we've got a fairly significant effect. We've gained 10, um, uh, 10 points, and that's very nearly a 17% increase. We've got the turn time down to 10.32, and we've got the roll rate to a much healthier 163. There's also an effect down here of 11.1% your maneuverability. Now, unless the K6 has also been built for maneuverability, and that's not the way I would build a K6, but 
not everybody does it the same way as me this should allow you to outturn albeit a little bit slowly a k6 so you with luck would be able to fly past it and then be able to turn on it and then unless the uh player attempts to flee um you can probably um get the better of it in a turn fight you can probably live with most p61s as well just before we discuss something else you can do to improve the maneuverability i alluded to it previously in the video let's just have a quick look at the altitude performance um we've got a two foot per second improvement in the climb rate you're definitely not going to notice that now pilot skills here aerodynamics expert here's the change aerobatics expert which means we've got engine guru one and marksman one but not engine guru two we happen to have eagle eyed on this pilot as well what can you do to improve the maneuverability well you'll remember i mentioned that this aircraft being a european can be assigned to any of the other five major nations and in particular you could assign them to either the united kingdom or the us if you assign the aircraft for instance to the us as i've mentioned here and you have the special pilot elise clark you will gain something like four to five points of maneuverability taking that figure up to 72 73 and with calibration experimental equipment you're going to be able to get up to say 75 maybe a bit more and then you really are in the territory when you can outturn p61s the vast majority of them and probably k6s and if that's your focus this is the build for you you could do something similar with the uk only this time you would use millie elliott but the effect will be less maybe two or three points i've flown all of these builds i don't like the second build particularly i do like the maneuverability build and i also prefer of the two speed builds um the first one here which is with the uprated engine now my win rate is around about 65. I don't pad my win rate. I don't fly overpowered bombers or other overpowered aircraft such as the P61 um, very much. I don't engage in flights, um, particularly the uh, nasty ones at high tiers of bombers plus heavy fighters and so on and so on. So my win rate at 65% is probably that of a good player without any padding. You may be wondering what these figures down here were and now I could tell you I have flown on my regular account the, the Reggiani 34 times and I've won 20 battles, which is a win rate of 58.8%, 59% as good as. And that is with the first speed build almost exclusively. That's with the uprated engine. On the, on the press account, I've flown the aircraft 46 times and I've won 28 times, which is 61%, shall we say. That's mostly with the turn build. And the average there is 60, or the aggregate, yeah, the average is 60% um, win rate on this plane. Does that indicate that the turn build is superior to the um, speed build that I prefer, the one with the uprated engine? Mm, it's a bit marginal. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think it's conclusive. I actually like both builds. I enjoy flying it both ways. I've got different aims, of course, when I fly it this way. I want to be sure that I can... Um, take down k6s and p61s with the maneuverability build at the expense of perhaps being able to chase down aircraft at speed such as heavies with the speed build i do find it satisfying chasing down heavies and shooting them down even though they're going as fast as they possibly can but the really imp important thing here is that across 80 battles i have a for me below average win rate i've got 60 percent i'm going to say again this is an aircraft which is on a par with the tech tree planes maybe even a little bit inferior to them and it's definitely not a reward plane soon to be a premium plane which is very powerful like the p61 or even to a lesser degree the k6 and if that's what you're looking for then this is going to be a disappointment to you if you like a challenge then this plane is interesting the map for the forthcoming battle is asian border it's the frontline variant. This is a four sector map with the sectors laid out in um, an upside down Y shape, at least from this perspective. A little bit unusual because this is a tier eight battle. We'll come on to that when we look at the order of battle. In the center, we have a command center, which is strategically and tactically the most important sector. 
not only because it gives you the three resources over five seconds, but it causes bar flights to attack em enemy sectors and provides easy access to the other three sectors. Probably the next most important is the air base. That will allow you to get repairs. You can spawn there. That's probably not so useful in this particular configuration since it only gives you easy access to the center, which is where you can get air fairly easily anyway. Or you can get a, a different aircraft of the same tier if you feel it's more appropriate to the battle or get full repairs, but it's a little bit out of the way for that. So not as significant as um, central repair bases, that's for sure. And then at the bottom of the tripod, if you prefer, or, or the top of the Y, depending on your perspective, we have a couple of mate weight garrisons. As a tier 8 battle, in theory we're not uh, plagued with multiple bombers, although the B-29C is always a threat of course. So the best way to win this is to hold the command centre in the airbase if you can. The command centre will then probably flip at least one of the garrisons um, to you using the bomber flights. Alternatively, just try and hold the three sectors that are nearest to your spawn point uh, for longer than the enemy and you will win the battle. We look at the order of battle we can see that as i said it's a tier 8 battle and we have one tier 8 and it's an il-20 a slow lumbering ground attacker with lots of ordnance so once it gets to a sector it's probably going to be able to flip it if it's got a little bit of support but it's going to take a long time to get there and do that for you and then we have tier 7s we have the f4u4 f4u4 corsair we have a b32 and then we've got three specialized aircraft myself in the reggiani re2005 a Spitfire 9 and a BF 109K6. The enemy, on the other hand, has two Tier 8s. They do have a Grand Attacker to counter our IL-20, and it's the relatively rapid ME329, so already that's a bit of a problem, because so it's going to get to sectors before the IL-20 if, if it's a race. They also have the near-obligatory P61, and that's a real threat. That's going to be able to potentially dominate the centre, or indeed any sector that it goes to. And then they have a Junkers 288, a bomber, a B-32, a Yak-3, and a BF-109G, none of which are specialised. And at this point, I'm flying with the speed build, and I'm thinking that the aircraft at Tier 7, I'm going to have to use slash and burn techniques on. We're going to have to see what the P-61 does. I'm going to have to be very careful about going into an engagement with that, and I may very well need to decline. Now, I've picked this, and it turns out, spoilers, to be a narrow defeat. But it's a Tier 8 battle, and I wanted to illustrate to you that by flying carefully, you can still make an impact in this aircraft, even though it's a Tier 7, which isn't particularly a powerful Tier 7. Let's go and see how the battle developed. So we head into battle. This is a natively recorded replay file. It's not one of the World of Warplanes team's files. The rest call will be accurate. The angel will be able to see me looking around. And I'm playing cautiously to begin with. Because this is a tier 8 battle and this is not a particularly strong aircraft, I'm going to make sure we get this sector secured here. And that will allow me to see what the situation is in the middle and whether I should go there and assist my team or whether I need to think about going somewhere else. So we take down our first ADA. And with this speed build, it's easy to keep up with the heavies at the sector. Of course, it's not quite so easy to hit these J4Ms, but we're getting the job done, and that's that se se um, sector secured. And I can see we're making progress to taking um, the command centre in the middle, so I'm going to go and try and help my team. I'm going to get some altitude with this speed build. I strongly recommend that you get this altitude so you've got the advantage of diving on your enemies. Probably a good thing even with the um, turn build as well. And I can see the P61 heavily damaged as it turns out, and that's an opportunity which I would have liked to take. So I'm watching it as I go in, and I begin to fire at it to try and knock it down. Now, if this was the K6, that plane would be dead. It's not the K6, and as you can see, it gets away from me a bit. I'm able to stay on it because it's checking for other targets, but my teammate takes it out, but in the meantime, we've managed to actually lose the command centre. The enemy turned that round completely. Take some pot shots at that plane. I begin to be shot at. Now I need to get out of here. I realise that none of the arrows are any longer close to me. If this B-32 had a potent uh, ar rear gunner armament, this would be a bad move. As it turns out, I'm able to get on his tail and I'm able to kill it, which gives us 60 points towards capturing this sector. 
and you saw I used altitude and speed there to get her away from the rest of the aircraft below me. Now I'm coming in to see what I can do in terms of removing more aircraft from here. Take a pot shot there. Take another pot shot there. And now I realise that I need to get out. Wait until the aircraft that's uh, in sector either pursue me and I can drag them out or choose to do something else. You can see that I've got several aircraft behind me there. Keep going. And you wouldn't be able to do this with the turn build, that's for sure. Now I realise that the P-61 is pursuing me. So I decide that I'm going to have a go at turning with him. Now, if it's a good turn build, I lose anyway. I've got nothing to lose by taking him on. And as it turns out, it's not a good turn build. And I'm able to get behind him and start filling him full of holes. Far enough away from anything else. His rear gunner injures my pilot. I'm able to heal that pilot. Let the guns cool down just a little. It's a tight one, this. And with 10 hit points on my airframe left, I knock down the P61. Now, that was just situational. It happened to be a P61 I could deal with. Sometimes that wouldn't have worked. Now we need to secure this sector. There's a P-47 in front of me. I set about destroying that. That secures the sector, and at the moment we're in a healthy 3-1 lead. Some pot shots at the ADA, and then I need to clear out this aircraft as well. It turns out to be the Yak-3. Something else destroys that, and now I can get repairs. So far, so good. I've avoided being shot down. I've used my escape technique with the speed build effectively, and... I've actually won a battle with the P61. Life is good. By the time I get repairs, it's actually back to two all. So I'm now off to the middle to see if I can do some defence. Again, I'm going to have to choose my engagements. There are some aircraft I'm going to have to run away from rather than engage, and that P61 is featuring in the mix. So we're having a close look at that, and also what else is in front of me. Now, I didn't boost into the sector. I wanted to see how the situation was developing. Unfortunately, as you will see throughout this battle, we lose the sector. A destroyer be uh, a Zvilling. That puts me in position to have shots at another aircraft. That's the BF-109G, which is destroyed by a teammate. F-2G comes at me. Now, I feel confident enough to be able to fill this full of holes. I've learned that they will tend to evade. You might think they would ram. Um, being heavy American aircraft, but they don't. Not on this uh, Reggiani RE2005. So we've removed a couple of aircraft. My teammates have removed at least one more. Now the base is unlocked. We're shooting at the air defence aircraft, even though the lock symbol is still in place. And against the air defence aircraft, I feel comfortable turning, even with the speed, but the speed build, and obviously with the turn fighting build, you are going to have no problem at all. And we've captured the sector, and now again things are looking relatively good because we're 3-1 up, but we are a few points behind. See the Zvilin coming back in. I the opportunity to shoot at that, so do my teammates between us. That's dispatched very quickly. And at the moment I'm feeling that defence is the order of the day. see a couple of aircraft heading first initially two multi-rolls heading towards the airbase one of these is going to be a p-47 sees me and begins to turn lumber towards me it's got no chance of getting on equal terms with me i can get behind it the p-47n becomes another victim again we had a period there where we were too all but now we're three one up again Think about going for the bomber flight. Change target. And realise that's the P61. I've outturned him, so I'm prepared to turn. And then I get distracted by another target. Probably this is a tactical error. I should have continued going for the P61. Set that plane on fire. But I've let the P61 get on my tail, and down I go. Still, first sortie, 10,000 points. Pretty good effort. Spawn at the airfield, which we still possess. We need to do some work to clear out enemies here. 
XP 72, tier 8. Got pretty good weaponry, so I don't really want to go head on with it. Although I did, and got away with it. It certainly can't outmaneuver me, even with the speed build, and now I can dispose of it. There it goes. Another multi roll. And these are the sorts of engagements that you're looking for all the time. You don't want to be fighting the turn fighters. You want to be taking on the multi rolls. You want to be taking on the heavies. A bomber or two, perhaps. A grand attacker. Many of the fighters you want to either approach only when they're severely damaged or when you have a considerable advantage, such as you're diving on them whilst they're doing something else from height and boost away. Another P-47N goes down. Take a look at the B-32. Very badly damaged, I can finish that off, and the score line is in, he won't be coming back. Useful plane to get out. And at this point, we look as if we're alright. We've got a slight lead, provided we keep our sectors, we'll be okay, but... Uh, two garrisons, one of ours and one of theirs, look like they're likely to fall. Let's hope they swap round. And we're going to see if we can do something about the command centre. I'm not seeing anything particularly worrying here, just air defence aircraft. It looks as if we ought to be able to do this. First air defence aircraft stubbornly refuses to die immediately. Head on to another one. And at that point I realise that we've lost our, the garrison that we possessed, but we are n not, and not going to, take the garrison that looked like we were going to take. And now we're in trouble, because the enemy's got a 3-1 lead. We aren't very close to taking a sector. I take out the ADAs as fast as I can. Avoid the multi roll that's coming in. If I can kill this, we can get the sector, but the enemy has taken the lead. We need another sector, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. End the J4M. A little bit difficult to hit. Down it goes. The enemy have spread out. There is the Grand Attacker just in front of me. I can take that out, but they've got other aircraft, two others, which are nowhere to be seen. But we haven't got the opportunity of taking out all of the enemy team. Get onto the Grand Attacker again. I'm far enough away, deliberately, not to be bothered by the bomb. Kill it. But it turns out to be that narrow defeat I mentioned. Just by nine points, a host of medals. The enemy only had two aircraft left. Koshadub, Hero of the Sky, Wing Legend, and 17,700 personal points. It's a good effort, just not a winning one. Let's have a look at the outcome of this hard fought battle. Five Chevron battle, Grade 1 fighter, as you can see there, grossing 222,012 credits, silver if you prefer. Of that, the base was 111,000 or thereabouts. Premium account bonus providing 55,500, and then an event bonus providing another 55,500. We only had repair costs here of 3,250 credits. I was using prepaid consumables, that is, I bought them in advance in a sale at half price, so no expenses for those. Aircraft experience of 4,571, the base is 2,230, premium account bonus providing half of that, 1,115, and then other bonuses, as you can see, providing just over 1,200 there. 228 for experience, base is 172, premium account bonus 72 extra. We've got three tokens, first medals of the day, a Kosher Dub, Hero of the Sky, and Winged Legend, and there you are, you can see the badges there. On the personal score tab, we can see that two of the class-specific missions were complete. The one for destroying aircraft when defending was three-fifths complete. That gives you 13 points, which is exactly what you need for a five-chevron battle. Personal points of 17,700. Five sectors captured, who was busy during that battle. 19 aerial targets destroyed, one short of the ace there. 7,376 damage to aerial targets and 27 criticals coming off the guns. Lost the aircraft once and we captured points at 620. That was divided 160 for defending and 460 for attacking. And if you have this kind of build, a speed build, probably that's going to be fairly representative of um, your game if you have a decent game. On the team score tab, we can see that that was enough for first place on my team, both by personal points and chevrons. That would have been the case on the enemy team as well, despite this being a tier 8 battle. 
Some reasonable contributions from the rest of the team. Could have asked for more from the K6, but he was down tiered, of course. The IL-20, not too bad. The F4U, the best performer there in the rest of the team. On the enemy team, unsurprisingly, top was the P61. Um, could have done better, and if he had, that would have been a bigger win. The bomber, probably relatively unmolested during the game, because I don't think we had a heavy um, going after him. And therefore 10,000 points and then a very good uh, 13 and a half thousand points here from the ME329 although interestingly only one chevron which suggests to me there may have been a bit of dogfighting in there very tight battle we were a bit unlucky to lose and I think the enemy will have been pleased to have won it that brings me to the end of my review of the Rajani RE2005 I've shown you a maneuverability build, which I think probably would be more suited to the EU server. And I've shown you a couple of speed builds, and I think one of those would serve you well on the NA server. There are all other options. For instance, I'm keen to try out a build with perhaps an uprated engine and a lightweight power unit, but having assigned the aircraft to the US and using Elise Clark to give me a bit more maneuverability. I think this plane is, as my video title says, a tricky challenge and I've enjoyed the challenge but I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who's had the time to grind out the missions and get the aircraft for free. If you're not in that fortunate position you'll need to know that this is not in the style of the recent reward aircraft because it's not a powerful plane. Well I hope you found that useful and that if you did you'll come and see my future content but until then this is the Noble Q signing out.